State of the County guests. Please take your seats. The show will begin momentarily. My name is Kristen Rohrbeck. I am the director here at the Oakley University's Joanne and Ted Lindsay Foundation Autism Outreach Services. I was a behavioral technician for a few years with a little girl with autism. I started with her when she was seven. I ended up working with her for about five years. I saw the way that my work was impacting her life, her ability to function independently and do different kinds of tasks, learn different kinds of skills. It made me realize that I wanted to be able to help more people. OU Cares offers supports for children ages three all the way up through adults with autism spectrum disorders, as well as their families, professionals, and the community. We serve about 2,300 plus people in the autism community in Oakland County and the region, offering over 100 programs every year. Majority of people who come to our program are from Oakland County, so we're really lucky to have such a great established relationship with the families of the Oakland County. There are a few things that I'm very proud of having accomplished as being a director of OU Cares, especially having helped develop and implement our free employment skills training for adults with autism. We have had over 35 individuals go through our program in the last few years, and they have either independently become employed or they are going on to further their education towards their career goals. So it's a really wonderful outcome from that program. In November 2018, we were extremely, extremely honored to be um, gifted a million dollars from the Ted Lindsay Foundation, specifically to help us develop and further engage adults with autism and teens with autism. We received a number of awards over the last few years for some of the trainings that we offer to Oakland County Parks and Recreation. It's definitely something that I'm proud of. We were able to get national recognition for helping to break down barriers within the recreation department, helping them to learn about autism. I was very lucky to be part of the Leadership Oakland Cornerstone program. I was able to integrate a lot of the information that I learned about Oakland County and the region into what I do personally and professionally. I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan and I studied both psychology and Spanish. And then I earned my master's degree at Ohio State University in developmental psychology. After I graduated, we came to Oakland County, especially because there was a lot of industry for both myself and my husband looking for jobs. Also a place where we have wonderful schools. We wound up in Farmington Hills. I live with my daughters and my husband. I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, two little girls. We like to take part in the parades. We enjoy going to the Farmington Civic Theater, seeing movies, going to the apple orchards, spending time at the Detroit Zoo, doing things in the area where we just make memories and have a lot of fun. We're really happy that we've landed here. My name is Kristen Rohrbeck, and I'm honored to be the 2019 Elite 40 Under 40 winner.
Dr. Temple Grandin, a world-renowned autism advocate who lives with autism spectrum disorder herself once said, the world needs different kinds of minds to work together. Oakland County exemplifies how diverse people in a multitude of industries come together to make our community strong and enticing places to live, work, and raise a family. This year's Oakland County Elite 40 Under 40 class shows how different individuals with unique talents and backgrounds can work together to, to make a lasting impact on our communities. I am proud of my Elite 40 class members who've leveraged their diverse backgrounds to attain success. I wanna congratulate everyone, especially my fellow finalists, Nicholas Christock and Dr. Candace Colby Scott. I'm humbled to be among such amazing group of people. Brooks Patterson has worked hard as our county executive to unite different minds and talents together within our region to improve Oakland County. He has implemented a number of innovative programs such as Medical Main Street, Tech 248, Emerging Sectors, Automation Alley, and Global Oakland, just to name a few, to ensure that Oakland County is and will remain a leader in Michigan's economy and beyond. I would argue that one of the most impressive achievements of his tenure is helping Oakland County reach full employment. Now that is an accomplishment that directly impacts all of us in our communities. As director of the Joanne and Ted Lindsay Foundation Autism Outreach Services at Oakland University, more commonly known as OU Cares, I help support over 2,300 people impacted by autism. One of the OU Cares programs I'm most proud of is our pre-employment skills training, designed to teach adults with autism the social or soft skills they need to not only gain, but maintain employment. Unfortunately, even in an economy with full employment, adults with autism face an estimated unemployment rate of at least 75 to 85%. Let me repeat that. <laughs> Adults with autism face an estimated unemployment rate of at least 75 to 85%. It's an astonishingly high number of people who have the ability to work, but may need extra support to be successful. I'm sharing this statistic because many of you have the power to help improve it. Give people with different abilities a chance in your companies. With all of our great minds working together, we can help change the drastic underemployment and unemployment rates of individuals with autism and other disabilities in our county. Under Brooks Patterson's tireless leadership, Oakland County is to be emulated in this regard. Back in 2015, the county launched a program to hire people living with different abilities, including autism spectrum disorders, to work part-time performing basic office tasks in various departments so they could acquire work experiences themselves. The program has been a huge success for the county and I guarantee it would be for your company too. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage our county executive, L. Brooks Patterson. in a room <laughs> a couple months ago and there were no chairs here where I was standing. I said, well, thank you for that standing ovation. <laughs> I, um, well, well, we just finished with Kristen and uh, she it was the winner this year. Uh, would the rest of the class who are here please stand and be recognized? Yeah. They, um, they're the future leaders uh, of this county, and for that matter, of this country. Uh, and uh, if you get to meet them individually, as I have, you're going to be very, very uh, impressed and uh, confident about uh, our future. Well, I'm with my speech. Uh, contrary to speculation in the media recently, I have not resigned my office. Uh, I'm here, and if the stock market doesn't improve, I may be here for the next six years, you know. <laughs> Firstly, <laughs> okay, you're all getting bumper stickers. Uh, first, the, first, the important news of the evening. Look carefully. That's my Christmas present from my staff, a little pug who, uh, who <laughs> poached a $5 bill out of my nurse's aide's pocketbook. <laughs> Got caught. 
I've, I've been spending the last two weeks trying to teach the value of a $20 bill. Yeah. That's daisy. Uh, back to reality. Welcome to the 2019 uh, State of the County address, stage right here in the new corporate headquarters of United Shore, right here in Pontiac. United Shore, just look around, uh, is one of the Inc. Magazine's fastest growing private companies in America. Now, our gracious host here at United Shore, President and CEO Matt Ishbia, who was a member of last year's class in the Elite 40, by the way, and Matt's father, United Shore Chairman Jeff Ishbia. Uh, United Shore purchased this stunning 610,000 square foot facility, which used to house Hewlett Packard, for about 40 million. They invested an additional 45 million for renovations, which include amenities that reward and inspire employees. These amenities include game rooms, executive rooms, full size basketball court, massage parlor, a salon, medical do doctors on site, a dry cleaners. Starbucks, did I mention the casino? <laughs> you name it. And they probably have it here for the convenience here for 2,600 employees who work in this building. Now compare that fact to that I'm talking to the county about installing indoor plumbing. It just seems to be. <laughs> but here's the best part of the story. This was a brownfield site. United Shore had access to almost $2 million in brownfield credits to clean up the property. They didn't take one cent from the government. Matt Ishbia, that I just introduced, was the president, is quoted in the paper as saying, quote, we didn't get handouts to get to where we are right now, and we're not taking handouts to get to where we're going. Now, how refreshing is that? A company that wants to do it on their own. <laughs> they want to grow on their own merits uh, and success rather than on the backs of the taxpayers. All right, so speaking of wanting indoor plumbing, as I did a moment ago, please welcome my colleague from Macomb County. Executive Mark Ackle. I, I saw Mark standing around the lobby before my speech began, and he had a turkey under his arm. And I said, well, Matt, Mark, what, what's that turkey all about? Is that like a service dog? And he said, no, the turkey's mine, and I keep it around for spare parts. I attended Mark's State of the County back in December. Now, he took some liberties in his speech to single me out, so I thought I'd return the favor tonight. <laughs> I look at Mark Hackle and marvel at the miracle of conception. <laughs> out of 50 million sperm, he was the fastest. <laughs> I want to recognize uh, my friend, too, Warren Evans from Wayne County Executive, who's with us this evening. Warren, welcome. And it's good to see you tonight. Also, a shout out to uh, a couple of friends of mine who have joined us from the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. You, do, you guys do great work up there. Keep it up. As we begin, let's open with a spectacular number. Oakland County's okay, spectacular number, by the way, $5 billion. Oakland County's Emerging Sectors Program to diversify uh, our jobs within the knowledge base of sector uh, surpassed $5 billion this past November. And that's $5 billion of new investment just within the emerging sectors portion of our economy since 2004. That number does not include traditional investment, such as automotive for entertainment and leisure. In that category, we increased our investment by another $3.5 billion. But tonight, I'm signaling out the $5 billion just within the emerging sectors. Now, that includes healthcare, IT, robotics, advanced manufacturing, and so forth. I'm sure you're impressed with the number, given the fact that it was built during the Great Recession and the challenges of competition around the state and around the country, and yet we were able to manage a $5 billion growth. A billion is a lot of money. Five billion is five times more. <laughs> I was always good with numbers in high school. <laughs> I don't know if anybody really appreciates what $5 billion in growth actually means. Billions and 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 billions. And <laughs> oh, well, somebody appreciates billions. <laughs> Many of you know about our Emerging Sectors Program. I've talked about it before. As I said, it's an initiative my administration launched in 2004 
to diversify Oakland County's economy away from dependence on traditional manufacturing jobs. We got clobbered back in 08 and 09. Um, Christ went bankrupt, GM went bankrupt, there were two major employers. We had so much of uh, dependence within that one sector, automotive. So we researched to find the 10 fastest growing jobs within the knowledge-based sector. To date, we've had 512 successes that have invested more than $5 billion, creating more than 51,600 jobs and retaining 37,000 jobs. Of course, we're planning a celebration to say thank you to our emerging sectors companies that helped Oakland County reach the $5 billion milestone. Uh, there will be an announcement about that shindig soon. But there's more to, to the story. Oakland County has fostered growth within traditional businesses too, outside of the emerging sectors realm. Since 2004, we have seen 345 traditional business successes, investing more than 3.24 billion, creating over 18,000 jobs and retaining 21,000 jobs. Combined, those two sectors, that's over eight and a third billion dollars, creating or retaining 129,000 jobs since 2004. That's not too shabby. I'll say, also take note that Oakland County companies are leading Michigan in innovation. According to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, there were 1,821 patents filed by Oakland County inventors in the year 2015. Now that's the last year for which there's published data. These accounted for a third of all patents filed in Michigan that year. Oakland County ranks ninth out of 3,100 U.S. counties for patents filed in 2015. Looking back to 2001, 12 out of the 15 of those years, we were the top 10 nationwide for the number of patents filed. Folks, if you want to be where the innovation is, Oakland County is the place. Now, there's further evidence that we're not just blowing smoke about the strength of Oakland County's economy. Oakland County is doing so well, we're outperforming states in some categories. For instance, the total wages paid by Oakland County companies to employees in 2017 added up to about $45 billion, surpassing the total wages earned in 16 states. The total employment in Oakland County in 2017 was over 728,000 jobs. That's better than 13 states. And here's a doozy. Oakland County exports in 2017 exceeded $14.4 billion, and that's surpassing the total exports of 25 states. And by the way, that figure represents one quarter of all the exported goods for the state of Michigan. Oakland County drives the Michigan economy. Where else would you want to be? Oakland County has enjoyed uh, about a decade of robust economic recovery since the Great Recession. This has been the longest period of sustained growth, job growth, since World War II. University of Michigan economists forecast that Oakland County will add 42,000 jobs, 2018, 19, and 20, over the next few years. Sometime the next year or so, we will have recovered the 163,000 jobs that we lost during the Great Recession. So we're about to come back to where we were uh, in the, from the spring of 2000 to, to the summer of 2009. Ergo, by 2020, the unemployment rate here in Oakland County is forecast to tie a, a historic low set back in 2000 of 2.6 percent. Also, per capita income in Oakland County was nearly 69,000 in 2017. That per capita income ranks us 13th nationally among counties with a population of one million. Oakland County has a balance, you heard me talk about this, Oakland County has a balanced three-year budget with a five-year lookout, one of the only counties in America to do so. That means we are always looking over the horizon to see what challenges lie ahead so we can address them now. That's called thoughtful management, not crisis management. My deputy county executive and resident guru, fiscal guru, is Bob Daddow, and along with my exceptional management and budget director, Lori Van Pelt, have informed me that they are beginning to see signs that the economy will soften sometime in the not too distant future. I can, however, give you two assurances tonight. One, we have successfully diversified Oakland County's economy with an eye toward reducing the effects of any down cycle. And two, my administration is already working to determine the effects that a down cycle will have on the county budget five years down the road so we can take the necessary steps to mitigate the problem now. <clears throat> uh, 
damn, it's water. <laughs> As anyone in business or government knows, the economy cycles. By 2020, our workforce will exceed 772,000. Three quarters of those added jobs will be in the middle to high wage category. With great success comes the challenge of developing new talent to fill current and future jobs. We hear regularly from employers who are desperate to fill positions. For instance, Dave Vanvin, on my staff, the Oakland County Director of Central Services, who oversees the Oakland County International Airport, says the aviation industry needs people in virtually all positions, from aircraft maintenance to mechanics to pilots. Oakland County and its workforce development partners are ramping up efforts to introduce high school students to both high-tech and skilled trade careers right here in Southeast Michigan. The highlight of this effort in 2018 was my career uh, quest. My, am I? There it is. My career quest Southeast, a regional effort to introduce high school students to companies and careers right here in their own backyard. The thought is we can show them they don't have to move away to find good paying jobs. About 8,000 students from 100 school districts in Oakland, Livingston, Macomb, Monroe, Washtenaw, Wayne counties encountered interactive hands-on activities and shared ideas with 800 exhibitors at the Suburban Showplace. It was incredible, huge hit. I wish I watched the video on the screen behind me and get a taste of what that remarkable day looked like. The goal of My Career Quest Southeast is to expose young people to the occupations that they didn't even know existed. It offered them the opportunity to participate in hands-on interactive exhibits in advanced manufacturing, construction, information technology, and health sciences. In each one of those quadrants, we had about 25 to 35 different occupations that were being exhibited by an awesome group of employers and labor partners and organizations and education providers from across the region. It gave students the opportunity to not just learn about the careers, but actually touch and feel and experience what that job is and how it works. Beaumont was excited to be involved in MI Career Quest. We helped by planning the event, serving as a platinum sponsor, and also served in providing live demonstrations for students across a variety of health disciplines. You know, most people think of jobs in the healthcare industry, they think of doctors and nurses. Participating in MI Career Quest provided us an opportunity to be able to showcase that we have literally thousands of jobs here at Beaumont Health that go well beyond nursing and being a physician. So typically you only see these type of events that are available to students that take the college path. So we really tried to focus on skilled traits, particularly for FCA. We wanted to show students that there is another career path that they can take directly out of high school and that they're plentiful uh, in terms of the opportunities that are available to them and, and exciting careers. Michigan Career Quest gave us the perfect vehicle to be able to reach out and expose students to those types of opportunities. Well, my favorite was definitely the ironworking exhibit. So you're roped in and you had to climb to the top and hit the bell and then slide back down. I'm a pretty talented climber, so I climbed up, hit the bell, and I slid back down, and then I had two business cards in my hand by the time I was done. It was pretty cool. One of my favorites at my career quest was this welding exhibit, and they had you put on a helmet, and you had a joystick, and you would move it around so you could see yourself welding and putting things together. It helped you see how it would be if that was actually your job, what you'd be doing for your life. We felt that it was important to bring this to Oakland County and the region so that we are generating that talent pipeline for the future, that we're responsive to the needs of uh, K-12 education to increase career awareness and also be responsive to the business community that's saying we need talent from right here in Southeast Michigan. We're excited to announce that My Career Quest Southeast will be returning to Oakland County uh, for the region on November 8th, 2019. You now, as an aside, uh, I saw the Beaumont spokesman in there. Uh, during that great recession, when, when GM and Chrysler went bankrupt, um, Beaumont leaped into first place as our major employer. The most, we got 17,000, and the car companies dropped down the line. 
I don't think they're even in the top 10 yet. Anyway, thank you for the nearly 200 volunteers from Michigan work agencies. They include the Michigan Talent Investment Agency, county governments, community colleges, and other groups who are part of making my career quest southeast a hit. The special kudos go to Oka County Workforce Development Manager, Jennifer Llewellyn, you saw her in the film. My Career Quest Southeast will return again this year. Uh, Jennifer, where are you, honey? Yeah. Can she stand up? Is she in the room? Jennifer? Okay, in the back. What the, what's the date of the new My Career Quest again? Okay, November 8th. Okay, great. Uh, we encourage for this, this my, my career request is showing these kids some important options. And they're a high paying job as well. And we want more companies to participate. Very easy. Uh, there'll be all kinds of notices going out. I'd love to have you be part of uh, my career request in 2019. Okanagan also uh, hosted another outstanding manufacturing day in October designed to inspire future job seekers. About 650 students from 16 Oakland County school districts toured 43 local manufacturing facilities. It was an opportunity for those students to learn that their future options are not limited. And certainly, they saw firsthand that this is not their grandfather's shop. It's important for you in the community to know that Oakland County supports its small businesses as well. I want to update you on Main Street, Oakland County. I've talked about it before. My administration launched this unique economic development program uh, for the county's 32 downtowns in 2000 with an eye on historic preservation and emphasis on creating a sense of place. Understand that 32 downtowns out of 61 communities in Oakland County. The difference is that townships, for example, don't have downtowns. We want Oakland County to be the destination of choice for dining, shopping, and entertainment. And Main Street Oakland County helps local governments redevelop their downtowns into vibrant, successful districts that serve as the heart of their communities. <clears throat> we joined the National Main Street Program and remain today the first and only countywide Main Street Program out of 3,000 in the United States. Since the year 2000 through the end of 2017, nearly $830 million has been invested in Oakland County downtowns, creating about 7,900 new jobs and well over 1,100 new businesses. If we, think about that for a second. This is during the Great Recession. We created 1,100 new businesses, plus 3.48 million square feet in additional floor space. Now, we did recently welcomed, uh, as our newest community, Berkeley, and they joined the Main Street Oakland County in 2018, and we're delighted that Royal Oak is back in the Main Street family because the city brings a great deal to the table as a popular destination. In total, 23 of our identifiable 32 downtowns have leveraged the services and expertise that Main Street Oakland County offers for small business development in our downtowns. Oak County is also boosting retail and commercial operations in certain corridors, where the corridors through the Corridor Improvement Authorities, maybe you haven't heard of that, <clears throat> it begins at the local level with our cities, villages, and townships. The idea that the infrastructure improvements such as roads and sewer upgrades may be made to certain commercial corridors to make them once again more attractive to investors. Now these corridors include right now that are up and running Sasha Ball Road at I-75 Independence Township, Brown Road between Joslin and Baldwin in Orient Township, Coolidge and 11 Mile in Oak Park, Grand River from 8 Mile to downtown in Farmington, and Grand River from Haggerty to Pass Beck in Novi. The corridor improvement authorities in those areas are working with us, the county, to achieve the necessary improvements to attract new business. For instance, on Brown Road, <coughs> Menards signaled to Orient Township that they would build one of their big stores if the roads were wider. Orion and the county widened the road, and now there is a Menards, which opened just this past August. Oak Park, yeah. Oak Park is still in the planning stages for the 11 mile and Coolidge area. The county is excited about the possibilities of the city's vision for making that area more pedestrian friendly, among other improvements, with an eye toward giving it a downtown feel. We are making remarkable progress in brownfield redevelopment. Brownfields are old industrial properties that need to be cleaned up so we can build anew. The Oakland County Brownfield Redevelopment Authority 
reports that recent projects attracted $270 million in new investment, bringing 1,900 new jobs with them. Now, there's optimism for a new life at the Summit Place at the mall up in, in Waterford Township. Back in September, Southfield-based Ariel Enterprises purchased the property with plans to demolish the condemned 1.4 million square foot mall this April. Ariel already owns the Sears store, to which the DTE Energy will now tear down to build a new 50,000 square foot storage facility with a couple hundred jobs. Sometimes you save uh, the best announcements for, for last and hold true for this section of my speech. I am pleased to announce that by the end of this year, blight will be eliminated in the city of Pontiac. <laughs> Volunteers actually walked the blocks of Pontiac to determine how many blighted homes. There were 960 in the city. Now, thanks to our partners in Pontiac, the state of Michigan, and Bill Pulte's Blight Authority, by the end of 2019, there will be none. Zero. We have a few dozen to go. We're doing that right now. And since 2012, Oakland County has administered more than $7.5 million in federal funds to eliminate the blight in Pontiac. Now, this has included not only tearing down homes, but where possible, rehabilitating them. Through competitive bidding, we kept the average cost of demolition to around 12000 per house. On the rehab end, it costs a little more than 19000 per house to fix them up. Now, a lot of credit belongs to my community and home improvement division managed by Kerry Reef, who has administered the federal funds used to eliminate blight planning since 2012. Kerry and her staff didn't just administer the federal funds, but uh, they also provided staffing assistance to Pontiac to ensure the program ran smoothly. And that's where Mike Booker comes in. He's the supervisor in CHI, CHI Community Home Improvement, and CHI Contract Compliance Unit, who uh, oversees the Community Development Block Grant Funds for Pontiac. He's done an outstanding job keeping watch over the funds and the program. And we must not forget Gordon Lambert, who's the chief of CHI, whose leadership has been pivotal. And by the way, None of this would have been possible without the cooperation of the leadership within the city of Pontiac. I want to thank and congratulate Mayor Deidre Waterman from Pontiac for her support and leadership during this rehab part, during this, uh, the uh, condemnation of the 960 homes. Let's give them all a round of applause. <clears throat> if you're not convinced by now that Oakland County is a place to do business, well, how was your nap? Oh, I'm just kidding. I'd like to turn your attention to the best public health professionals in Michigan. That's the Oakland County Health Division. They do exceptional work to address public health needs and consistently receive state statewide and even national recognition for their community partnerships focused on current public health issues. They have a shelf full of awards to prove it. There are two current health issues that demonstrate the effectiveness of the leadership in the county's largest division, my health division. The hepatitis A outbreak and PFOS, or polyfluoroalkyl substances, yeah, you say that again. Uh, the, um, these are industrial chemicals which have made headlines recently after being detected in Michigan lakes, rivers, streams, and water systems. First, let's talk about the hepatitis A outbreak, which was the largest in U.S. history. The good news is that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention declared Oakland County no longer to be in an outbreak county in that category this past November. The tough climb out of outbreak status is due to the extensive outreach efforts of Oakland County's public health team and the overall commitment to go above and beyond the call of duty. Over a two-year period, the health division focused on high-risk individuals. At the Oakland County Jail, health department nurses show up daily to convince inmates to receive a vaccination. The effort, by the way, is ongoing as we speak. They also administered hepatitis A vaccines at substance abuse treatment facilities, at homeless shelters, and warming centers. Now, out of an abundance of caution, the health department also worked with the county's 4,300 restaurants and even the Renaissance Festival. <laughs> they were co convinced that their employees had and were on the front line of preventing the spread of this infection and should be vaccinated. Credit for this remarkable response belongs to the health service as a whole. I mean, this whole group, nearly everyone who works there was involved in some aspect of the county's response. And I said a moment ago, that's my largest department. And then there's PFAS. 
The only issue recently came to our attention when the state of Michigan issued a blanket advisory, remember, not to consume fish caught in Kent Lake or the Huron River. The source of the PFAS for Kent Lake and the Huron River still remains under investigation, while the state continues to sample for PFAS. Initial results indicate that PFAS is impacting many areas of Michigan, and perhaps Oakland County. Oakland County Health Division is working with both the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services so we can stay informed about the sampling plan and what, state, what steps the state is taking toward mitigation. Meanwhile, in response to PFAS and other emerging environmental issues, the Health Department last year formed a new environmental investigation team whose mission is to respond to complex environmental concerns, including water contamination, such as PFAS, harmful algae blooms, or waterborne illnesses, such as Legionnaire's disease. Their directive is to leave no stone unturned to identify the source of water-related contamination or illness. On a final note on public health, I'm pleased to announce that this evening that the Oakland County Health Division has garnered national recognition for their emergency preparedness. The National Association of County, City, and Health Office Officials awarded the Oakland County Health Division its prestigious Project Public Health Ready recognition. Uh, the award spotlights local health departments, which demonstrate preparedness and response capability through a nationally recognized set of rigorous standards focused on three goal areas, all hazards planning, workforce development, and demonstration of readiness either through exercises or real events. Now, today or uh, tonight, to, to, uh, I want to pick out a couple. Uh, we have themes for people and places. Oak County is a place where businesses want to invest and families want to live, work, and play because our quality of life is second to none. The people who live and work here are incredible, too. I want to share some amazing stories with you tonight. I'd like to begin this se section, which I call Everyday Heroes, by highlighting two health division employees who discovered lead contamination in food that resulted in a national voluntary recall. Nadia Batusa is a public health nurse and has served Oakland County residents with distinction for over 23 years. Health Division was notified of a child whose lab test indicated higher than normal lead levels in his blood, which prompted Nadia to immediately schedule a home visit. The parents of the lead poisoned child spoke English as their second language, but Nadia was fluent in their native language, enabling her to explain what lead is, its negative effects, and how it's absorbed into the body. Due to the severity of the child's lead poisoning, Nadia determined a full environmental investigation was necessary and brought in senior public health sanitarian Richard Pesky. The rest skip, sorry. Richard diligently pursued multiple potential sources of lead, both inside and outside the home, including food and spices. Initial readings from commercially prepared spices in the home indicated a lead hazard. Working collaboratively with the family, Nadia and Richard obtained unopened packages of spice that led to confirmatory testing, indicating very high levels of lead in those spices. This culminated in a national voluntary food recall of seven ounce plastic jars of Baraka curry powder and hot curry powder. A national recall. Nadia Richard, please stand so we can congratulate you on your excellent work. Thank you. Now, this next person, well, he's just incredible. Tome Ivesia is a 24-year-old first-generation uh, American. He's a supervisor at a Chrysler plant, and he operates his own cleaning business. When he was even a younger man, he made an agreement with the Almighty. As Tome tells it, he asked God to bless him with success as an entrepreneur, and in return, he would give back to the community. Well, he became a success. They didn't know exactly how to give back, so he prayed for a sign. Afterwards, he signed on to the LinkedIn and found a fundraising effort for a play structure at Mandy's Place at the Oakland County's Children's Village. For those who are unfamiliar with Mandy's Place, it's where abused and neglected children receive in-depth crisis intervention and support while they're the county's care living at the Children's Village. The Playscape will provide them with a sense of being a kid while dealing with some very serious issues. Tommy contacted Children's Village and asked what the cost of the entire project was. They told him $25,000. Later that day, he dropped off a check for the whole amount. This, I'm no kidding. <laughs> he 
This level of generosity from a 24-year-old is truly remarkable. And all because he feels like he's been blessed and wants to share his blessings with others. Tell me, you have Oakland County's profound gratitude for your generosity. Please stand and be recognized. Hello. I, I know what you're thinking, girls, but Tommy has a girlfriend, so. <laughs> you know, Tommy, I had a similar experience to yours. Not quite as significant, perhaps, but I was late for a doctor's appointment. And when I got to the, to the office, the parking lot was full. And I said, please, God, open up a, a parking space, and, and I will triple my contribution on Sunday. Well, then a car pulled out right in front of me. I said, never mind, God, I found one on my own. <laughs> <laughs> Continuing our uh, heroic odyssey at Children's Village, I want to share with you the life-saving efforts of some of Children's Village employees. On August 7th, food services supervisor Carla Jensen uh, suffered a massive heart attack while working at Children's Village. Contingent staff nurse Tracy Chewing, recently retired general staff nurse Patricia Thompson, the first cook Mary Wright sprang into action performing CPR and using the AED machine. They alone with several contractors, kept her alive until the Waterford Fire Department arrived. Were it not for their quick action, Carla would not be with us today, and we're so happy that she is. Well, Carla, Tracy, Patricia, and Barry, please stand and see, we can see where you are. Thank you. All right. Finally, it's a tough job in law enforcement uh, these days. Yet these first responders continue to run toward the danger. In the wee hours of the morning on January 28th, the past 2018, Oakland County Deputy Michael Miles was patrolling Orion Township when his speeding car zoomed past him. Deputy Miles turned his patrol car around, activating his lights and sirens in an attempt to catch up to the speeding car. The fleeing vehicle lost control and crashed into some trees, uh, flipping on its side uh, and uh, the vehicle burst into flames with the driver trapped inside. Deputy Miles, putting himself in harm's way, took his baton, broke the window, and pulled the driver to safety. <laughs> Let's watch this incredible dash cam video right now. Maybe there's a vehicle I've lost now. 15, 13, it's going over 100 miles an hour. Speed going over 100 miles an hour. Maybe no. Ah, uh, he went into the woods. Um, he's on fire. Give me fire on in route. He crashed. Captain, fire in route. Yep. Yeah, I see that, buddy. Who else is in the car? Who else is in the car? Yeah, get out. Uh, uh, sir, I don't know what happened. Uh, get out. Here, get away. Get out. Come on. Stay there. You broke your, something wrong? Yeah. What's wrong? I think my leg's broke. Stay there. Hold on. There you go. I, I got it. He's out of the car. I'm trying to drag him away from the fire. Oh, thank you, sir. Let's get away from it. All right. Yeah, he's just patient. Yep. Stay there. Stay there. Yeah, yeah. He's my right leg. Yeah, these legs are open. All right, let's get him away from yeah. us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. Ready where I go. For his actions, Deputy Miles was named Officer of the Month in November by the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. Deputy Miles, we salute you. Would you please stand so we can applaud your bravery? <laughs> On 
I understand, Deputy, that you could have gotten to the car a little sooner, but you took time to adjust the dash cam just for right <laughs> just something. Ah, uh, this is a great county. Um, you know, there are some outstanding individuals associated with our Oakland County International Airport as well. Did you know Michigan's second busiest airport has a $675 million annual impact on our region? Professional Pilot Magazine named one of our airport tenant businesses, it's Pennistar Aviation, the best independent FBO, that's fixed base operator, the best FBO operator for 2018, a well-deserved national recognition. Oakland County International Airport has more than just an economic impact, however. It has a community impact as well. There are many ways the individuals associated with the airport help the community throughout the, throughout the year. One example is Operation Good Cheer, where more than a couple hundred pilots from around the state volunteer to fly in to Oakland County International Airport, load up and deliver 20,000 gifts to thousands of foster children around Michigan at Christmas time. Then there are another 1,500 volunteers backing these pilots up. Oakland County International Airport is a, and its associated businesses and their employees are providing countless hours of service to our community. Let's look at the video to get a glimpse of Operation Good Cheer this year. Every December, over 200 pilots in their airplanes provide volunteer services and thousands of presents are gathered here at the airport and then flown to airports all across the state of Michigan so that children of foster care facilities and homes might enjoy a Christmas. Operation Good Cheer is a all-volunteer gift-giving program for children in foster care. We partner with social service agencies to enroll children. So we contact donors who then purchase the Christmas gifts for the children in foster care. The weekend of Operation Good Cheer, we had 1,200 registered ground volunteers, a couple hundred pilots, numerous aviation groups that have employees and families that, that help as well. Pentastar is a great supporter of our organization. When Operation Good Cheer outgrew its original facilities, they approached us and we're more than happy to support the operation. We serve as the main collection point. Trucks and aircraft bring presents to Pentastar and then they are collected in our hangar, coordinated and distributed across the state on the following day. Employees at every level get the privilege of helping 6,000 kids celebrate Christmas. Who wouldn't be proud to be a part of that? The contribution that Oakland County Airport has made to Operation Good Cheer has just been phenomenal. These children write expressions of thanks that they just cannot believe that there are people who really do care for them. And that's always been something that keeps me enthused about the program. you in some county programs that mentioned uh, previously in some of my state and the county speeches. Last year, we introduced you to our new Oakland County Animal Shelter and Pet Adoption Center, which we relocated from Auburn Hills to uh, the government campus in Pontiac. We anticipated that the more central location and new facility would increase adoptions, indeed pet adoptions are up 7 to 8 <clears> percent. <throat> Another item, speaking of providing service to the community, that you, I'm sure you've all heard of Haven. That's the organization that provides temporary shelter and other services to adults and children who are victims of domestic abuse. Well, the animal shelter is helping out by taking care of the pets of these families that temporarily stay in Haven shelter without cost until the owners find permanent housing. So credit to Public Services Director Mark Newman, Animal Control Manager Bob Gett, Chief Joni Toole, and all the animal shelter staff uh, for a job well done. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, there is the off-road vehicle ORV Park in Holly and Groveland Townships, <coughs> excuse me, taking shape at the old gravel pit just east of Mount Holly Ski Resort. It's a partnership between Oakland County Parks and Recreation and the State of Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Even auto companies have taken a notice of what we're building. They've indicated their interest in utilizing the ORV Park uh, as a testing facility for future development of their off-road models. <laughs> a a long-term operating agreement between the county and the DNR is anticipated to be signed 
for the next few months and will lay the groundwork for this unique state and county partnership. <coughs> the RV park will lease parking from other facilities like Mount Holly seven months out of the year. And that's slated. This ORV park is slated to open in 2020. And I said a moment ago, I've been out there. I mean, it is crazy. See the picture? It's like Black Friday at Somerset. Um, <laughs> government to, okay, the next, uh, what do we call it? Yeah. Government to government, or G2G, is uh, Oakland County's initiative to, to collaborate with other governments by providing and sharing cloud-based service technology, which we developed and is now we're sharing with local governments. I've seen our information, it's overseen by our information technology department, Chief Information Officer and Deputy County Exec Phil Berlini, Director Mike Kim, and, and their staffs. The G2G generates two million a year in revenue now, <clears throat> which is shared with our local partners, the cities, the villages, and the townships. And that number will continue to grow. Our IT department also operates CLEMIS. That stands for Court and Law Enforcement Information Management System. Uh, which uses innovative computer technology for criminal justice and public safety applications. It promotes sharing of information among the consortium of local, state, and federal agencies. And more than two now, more than 200 agencies spanning a number of Southeast Michigan counties, it's the largest crime dating shared network in the United States. Today we're delighted to share with you <coughs> the Columbus footprint continues to expand with the addition of Huron County. That brings the number of counties in our service area to nine. Next, there are some items that underscore why Oakland County is the best place to live, work, play, raise a family. I love this one. According to the National Council for Home Safety and Security, 16 of the 20 safest cities in Michigan are in Oakland County. I shouldn't single up. I saw Bouchard here earlier, but obviously law enforcement is a major part of it, as with the local communities as well. Next, my administration will recommend a reduction in property taxes from the current 4.04 mills to 4.00 mills in the fiscal year of 2020. But, yeah. We have retained our AAA bond rating for 21 straight years, providing us with the lowest possible rates in the bond market. We anticipate significant bond activity over the next five years, most of it in the south end of Oakland County. AAA will save those communities millions of dollars in lower interest rates. We, you know, what a, some of the things we do, I'm reading them this evening, Sarah uh, Adam. We refurbish and rededicate Oakland County's World War I memorial plaque by relocating it from the lobby of the Board of Commissioners Auditorium to a prominent location right outside the courthouse main entrance. At the picture. Next year, believe it or not, Oakland County will celebrate its 200th birthday. We have formed an Oakland County Bicentennial Committee headed up by Judge Mike Warren. Mike, what's that? What's your head up here? <coughs> he and his committee are working on plans for a big celebration, of, yeah, obviously celebrating our 200 years. Judge Mike Warren, uh, as the chairman of the Oakland County Bicentennial Committee, uh, we picked up the clicker already, good. Uh, I wish you come up here on the stage, and uh, when cued, I want you to hit the clicker and um, pull back the curtains. We have um, the logo. We, we've had some competition. Don't hit it yet, Dama. Um, we had competition in, in the county, and uh, the logo is the shared effort of a variety of graphic designers who work for various departments within the county. You ready, Mike? I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Hit the click. All right. And that, obviously, it's, it's very clear. We didn't mess it up with a lot of, you know, graphics. It's the 200th year, 1820 to 2020, Oakland County, Michigan, Bicentennial. And uh, Mike, thank you for your support and your leadership. And, and another point, uh, we're obviously looking for volunteers to participate. Uh, they're indeed welcome. Uh, and so I encourage you to step up. And as an aside, while I got Mike up here, uh, he was given an honor in his own right this past year. He was recognized as top judge of the year this past fall by the International Association of Top Professionals. Well deserved. Wow. Continuing our quick hits section, a $50 million development called Asian Village 
along Grand River and Novi will feature restaurants, retail, offices, housing, and a 25,000 square foot marketplace. A $100 million, 67 acre downtown district featuring retail, restaurant, entertainment, and condominiums is coming to Commerce Township at Pontiac Trail and M5. And finally, Oakland County will begin to pursue the designation of a Communities for a Lifetime. Now, this distinction will recognize municipalities who improve their planning processes to develop age-friendly communities. And my last birthday had nothing to do with my support of this project. <laughs> I think you all can really tell how proud I am of Oakland County, the businesses, and obviously the residents. Uh, we have a list of notables who were born here. This is sort of fun to share it with you tonight. Did you know that the current president of Harvard University, Lawrence Backow, has his roots in Oakland County? He grew up and was educated in Pontiac. Oakland, yeah, Oakland County. <laughs> Oakland County has launched other notables, such as General Motors CEO, Mary Barra, uh, retired Microsoft CEO, Steve Ballman, grew up right here in Oakland County. Uh, here's an impressive one, I like this one. Andrew Fustel, an astronaut, who just returned October 4th from a six-month stay on the International Space Station as flight engineer for Expedition 55 and commander of Expedition 56. Not only did he graduate from Lake Orion High School, he also earned his associate's degree in science from Oakland Community College. <laughs> uh, he went on to get his PhD and, and now is a ge uh, geologist. Well, that captures the imagination of dinner. A community college associate's degree can lead to such great heights. Ah, <laughs> fun, fun. Um, then, of course, uh, Oakland County's connection to the popular Netflix film Bird, uh, Bird Box, starring Sandra Bullock. No, uh, Sandra's not from Oakland County, I wish you were. Uh, rather, Josh Mollerman, the author of the New York Times bestseller Bird Box, on which you know, he wrote the movie based on a lifelong uh, effort he uh, grew up in, and still is a resident of Ferndale. Uh, as I approach the concluding section of the speech, I'd like to introduce you to some new leadership for Oakland County's Department of Economic Development and Community Affairs, Dr. Tim Meyer and Mike McCready. Dr. Meyer was the longest serving chancellor of Oakland Community College, uh, Michigan's largest community college. <clears throat> as OCC's chief, uh, Tim developed an innovative strategic plan focused on student success provided fiscally sound leadership by initiating a three-year budget process, initiated a $25 million expansion of the Southfield campus medical training facilities, launched the innovative Michigan Advanced Technician Training Program, an advanced manufacturing apprenticeship program with the state, and so much more. Now he's my deputy county executive charged with continuing the success of our initiatives to tr attract jobs within the knowledge-based economy, bolster small business development, and fill the gap in skilled trades. That's all, Tim. <laughs> Mike McCready, who is my Director of Economic Development and Community Affairs, in his own right as an entrepreneur, who is the principal of McCready & Associates in Birmingham, a small business that represents commercial furniture manufacturers. He's a former state legislator from Bloomfield Hills, and he also previously served on the Bloomfield Hills City Commission as mayor and the chairman of the zoning board. His business acumen, as well as his experience in the public sector advancing economic development, made him the best qualified candidate to join my administration. Now, Mike replaces Irene Spanos, to whom we offer our best wishes and success as she joins Oakland University as the Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations. <laughs> Rounding out our economic development team is the addition of Mike Kowal, who just recently retired from the Michigan State Senate due to term limits. Uh, while at Lansing, Mike served on all the right committees involving economic development. When it comes to that, that part of the economy, he's, he's an expert. Uh, he's a small business owner as well, and was a former local elected official, that being the White Lake Township Supervisor, which under his leadership really kick-started that township into economic overdrive. So, So, Deputy Tim Meyer, Director Mike McCready, an economic and legislative liaison, Mike Cobalt, any county would love to have any one of these guys, but we're blessed to have all three in our county. I call that murderer's row. 
<laughs> and they're, they're pushing for quality economic development and they know what to do. Some other individuals I'd also like to salute are the people who are retiring from Bolton County Service. One of my favorite, Mary Langhauser, who is the minister, administrator of the Oakland County Fiscal Services Division, is retiring after 31 years. And two founding members of the board, <laughs> and two founding members of the BFC, that's the Business Finance Corporation, uh, member, two members of the BFC, the board of directors Fred Seeley and Martin Ho Holander, also retired. Belinda Dugan, supervisor in Oakland County's Veterans Services Division, who gave care and compassion to those who defended our nation is retiring after a quarter century. And finally, Dr. Ruben Ortiz Rees, a forensic pathologist in our renowned medical examiner's office, retired just this past month. Again, please give a round of applause to him for the years of service. <clears throat> uh, that's the challenge today. I mean, my workforce is getting older. Uh, we're going to lose, some, we just did, we just lost some real talent. Now we've got to replace them with uh, equally good talent out there. Uh, that, and that's up to all of us that refer them in. By the way, she's not retiring. But I need to mention our Director of Human Resources, Jordy Kramer. Uh, you see, for the second year in a row, my media communications officer, Bill Mullen, scheduled the state of the county speech on the evening of her birthday. <laughs> I'll, I'll say, where are you, Jordy? Jordy. I also understand, I also understand, Jordy, you're missing your free birthday meal at the house just so you can be here. So, you just were handed, uh, first of all, I apologize for the scheduling conflict. And uh, so, to make it up to you, we just gave you a certificate for dinner at the Highland House. <laughs> so, you'll get it anyway. <clears throat> to close this speech, I need to address the misperception that somehow Oakland County does not support our region. You probably all heard that. On the contrary, Oakland County supports the region in ways others do not. The Oakland County Business Finance Corporation, I just showed you some of the people in that, was formed to help businesses both inside and outside of Oakland County borders. Since 2004, we've helped at least 99 companies outside of Oakland County with business financing, which has resulted in $136 million in total project financing. It may surprise some of you, maybe the critics, to know that five of these projects were in the city of Detroit, including a $13 million investment for a company that makes milk powder for premium chocolate manufacturing. In suburban Wayne County, the BFC, the Business Finance Corporation, has assisted 14 firms with projects that resulted in over $16 million in total project financing. In Macomb County, uh, 45 companies have sought help from Oakland County BFC, which resulted in more than $59 million in total financing. So, as an FYI to the, to the doubters, succinctly put, Oakland County Business Finance Corporation has helped just over 500 companies in Oakland County to obtain financing since uh, its inception in 1982. 41% of those businesses, by, by the way, uh, were in Pontiac or the south end of the county. Democratic you know, control, let's face it. Uh, Oakland County and, and then the south end captured 35% of the loan amounts, resulting in 45% of the total project financing very, very effective. As, as mentioned earlier, we operate and provide support for Clemens. Uh, that's a regional public safety network for sharing public safety information, providing computer-based application to improve law enforcement and fire response. Now that is truly a regional effort. I founded Automation Alley as a regional manufacturing and technology business association in 1999. Today, it has about a thousand members throughout Southeast Michigan. We opened an office in, in Macomb County helping businesses in our region obtain military contracts. And Automation Alley also opened an office in downtown Detroit in 2013 to give businesses in the Tech Focus Madison block easy access to programs and services. And when requested by the Detroit City Council as well as a couple of mayoral administration, mayoral administration, I have sent staff down to Detroit to share our best practices in budget, information, technology, and more. And for Wayne County, uh, Bob Datto helped them determine how to resolve their budget challenges in the hopes of avoiding a state takeover. While I'm at it, Oakland County taxpayers, you pay a lion's share of the regional taxes. You cover 40% or more of the millages that support the Detroit Institute of Arts, the Detroit Zoo, and the smart bus system. Since inception, 
Oak County taxpayers have paid $380 million in support of SMART, our sub suburban bus system. That's $40 million more than Macomb and $100 million, $118 million more than Wayne County. Detroit receives some of the SMART services, but that doesn't pay. Over the life of the Detroit Zoo Village, Oakland County taxpayers have paid nearly $54 million, which surpasses Wayne County by about $12 million and Macomb County by $26 million. The Detroit Institute of Arts Millage shows similar results. Oakland County taxpayers have paid $61.6 million, which is $13 million more than Wayne and $30, more, $30 million more than Macomb. Bottom line, Oakland County is paying more than its fair share to support the region and then some. Is there any wonder that I bristle at the mendacity of some critics when I hear them say that Oakland County is not a regional player? Ah, contraire, my friends. Oakland County <coughs> supports Cobo Hall, too. Taxes are collected from hotels in Oakland, Macomb, and Wayne counties. Uh, plus, there is uh, a contribution to Cobo from the state's 4% liquor tax. Unfortunately, the state doesn't report its hotel tax collection by county. But for the state, liquor tax, however, the amount collected from Oakland County from 1986 to the end of the fiscal year 2017 was $135 million. I did my best to keep that number up. Uh, <laughs> that's $18 million more than the city of Detroit and $15 million more than suburban Wayne County and $31 million more than Macomb. Now, I'm labeled as, sometimes as an obstructionist because I always hold out for the best management model that protects my taxpayers, you. I did the same for the legislation that created the new Detroit Regional Convention Facility Authority. Have you seen Hobo lately? It's beautiful. It's among the best convention facilities in the United States. The overhaul came in on time, under budget, all under the management model yours truly insisted upon. Prior to being under the management, the new management, the Detroit Regional Convention Facility Authority, there was rampant corruption at Cobo that saw the former manager and a, and a contractor go to prison. Have you seen any kind of reports like that today at Cobo? Absolutely not. Tonight, <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with the sense that Oakland County is a unique place and, and the right place to grow your business, to find talent, to educate your children, enjoy indoor and outdoor entertainment, to raise a family, and even retire here. I get to take many bows for all the good news going on here because I am the county executive, but there are so many who are part of the effort to make Oakland County the place you want it to be and the people you want to know. First, I'd like to thank all of the Oakland County employees who set the standard for what good government looks like. i also like to acknowledge the other county elected officials who share the vision of how great Oakland County can be. Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bouchard, Water Resources Commissioner Jim Nash, County Clerk Registered Deeds Lisa Brown, Treasurer Andy Meisner, Prosecutor Jessica Cooper, Board of Commissioners Chair Dave Woodward, Circuit Court Chief Judge Selena Kumar, Probate Court Judge Kathleen Ryan, 52nd District Judge, uh, Court Chief Judge Joe Fabrizio. Their commitment and diligence to enhance Oakland County's outstanding reputation, especially in our court system, uh, I'm going to call that to your attention. I have one last. <coughs> sure, let's give it I have one last thing that I want to say tonight, but I do so with some apprehension and trepidation. I say apprehension, apprehension because it may be presumptuous of me to approach a subject of such gravitas. It all started when I came across a quote from Benjamin Franklin, and I've seen it many times since. As Franklin was leaving the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, the very convention that drafted our form of government that we live under today, a group of people approached him and said, Mr. Franklin, what have you given us? And his response was, quote, a republic if you can keep it, end quote. Think about that, a republic if you can keep it. I've thought about that a lot, and being sort of an amateur history buff myself. And I went back and did some research to determine the context in which that statement was made. It was after the delegates to the Constitutional Convention in 1787 had finally voted to approve a new form of government than we see today. What was left out of the history books is the discord at the convention about creating a democracy or even a constitutional democracy. Some of the delegates, James Madison for one, uh, considered that what we, we were embracing a form of government 
that enshrined mob rule. A pure democracy, as you all know, is when the whole town shows up and makes decisions. Okay. A representative form of government is a similar approach, but we send our representatives to, to Washington and Lansing to vote on our position. It was considered a very fragile framework back then, and I think it might even be more fragile today. You've heard of the Federalist Papers? Basically, those were letters from three of the drafters of the Constitution explaining what they had just passed in the convention. One of the more quotable papers is Federalist Paper Number 10, drafted by Delegate Madison, who went on later to become the fourth president of the United States. As an aside, the founding fathers of our great nation, as Jefferson, Franklin, Madison, Washington, Adams, they were some of the brightest Americans to have ever served in our country. And here's an anecdote I want to share with you tonight. When John Kennedy was president, he invited members of MINSA, that's an organization which is a distinguished group of people who tested out at the genius level. He invited them to a dinner at the White House. He said on that occasion, quote, we have assembled here tonight the brightest people in our country to ever have dinner in the White House, with one exception, when Jefferson died alone. Having recognized the knowledge, experience, and intelligence of our founding fathers, you can see why I am suffering on the altar of presumptuousness, but I feel compelled to speak out tonight. In his Federalist Papers, Madison attempted to address the dangers of factions, F-A-C-T-I-O-N-S, factions, that would inevitably arise in a democratic government. He defined a faction as a group of citizens with interests that are adverse to the rights of other citizens or adverse to the best interests of the nation as a whole. He said, quote, because of the nature of man, such groups are inevitable, and moreover, in a free society, they are unavoidable. They arise from different interests, opinions that naturally exist, end quote. A major point stressed by Madison was if a faction is in the minority in a republic form of government in which the will of the majority decides the outcome, it basically ensures the faction will not prevail. But the problem arises when a faction itself occupies a place within the majority. And that's my point today. I think Madison put us on notice over 231 years ago that if factions were to move into majority, they could undermine our republic. And that was the very prescient observation by Madison. Now, here's where I venture out on the thin ice. Factions are in government today, and they fear, I fear, that uh, they, they're tearing at the very fabric of our republic form of government. They are destructive, they are immoral, and whether it's the abusive treatment of Justice Brett Kavanaugh to abortions on demand, even on the mother's due date, which is now the standard in New York State, legislation that was passed with a standing ovation through the first order of business this year under Nancy Pelosi's speakership, where she threatened to do away with, quote, so help you God, when administering an oath. The factions are real, and they are a threat. We have Antifa, moveon.org, by any means necessary. They become more vitriolic, threatening the worst of mob rule that ultimately could destroy the republic that our forefathers dared to launch. I see on TV the vitriol at every public gathering, the disruption, the violence, the outward resistance to authority, and a complicit media that for some unstated reason hates their president and endangers their country. I don't propose a cure tonight. That'd be way above my pay grade. I'm just raising one man's concern about the future of his country. I joined the Army back in 1962 to 64. There's no question that I loved my country then as I do now. And I see every day on the news, week by week, month by month, the inexorable and inedible destruction of our great country. I'm concerned because I fear that my, I got a bunch of them here in the front row, my 11 grandkids will not live in the America that I grew up in. I'm not talking about Ozzie and Harriet and Norman and Rockwell. I'm talking about a country where the rule of law is respected, where the death of a police officer is abnormal where political correctness is a thing of the past, where tolerance again exists in our public discourse, in our political discourse, where judges who judge and leave the lawmaking to the legislature, where nationalism is encouraged, and where American exceptionalism is applauded. So on your way home tonight, think about what Ben Franklin had to say. Every public, if you can keep it. Thanks for coming tonight, my friends. Thank you for your support. Thank you very much, Dana. Uh, as you all know, we'll have an afterglow out this.
in the lobby. I'll join you out there as soon as possible. Thank you all for coming tonight.